Zechariah. Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Zechariah, would you? I was just testing you to see if you actually paid attention yesterday or not. And if you said anything besides Zechariah, I want to talk to you at the end of the invitation, all right? Uh, we began our study in Zechariah 1 and 2 learning something about how to get ready for God, how to prepare our temple, our hearts, for what the Lord wants to do, for the presence of Christ and for the glory of God. And then we really concentrated all day yesterday in Zechariah chapter 3. And now in this hour, we come to Zechariah chapter number 4. It's 14 verses long. And if you'll permit me tonight, I want to read the entire chapter without making any comments so you'll get the, the, the flow of the whole thing. And then we'll go back, and I'm going to give you some principles tonight that I hope will be of great help and encouragement to you. Before we read this passage, can I just get something out of the way, all right, so that this will be very clear to everyone? Israel and the church are not the same thing. Now, there are people that believe they are and they confuse the two, but when you study the Bible, the Lord makes a very clear uh, delineation between Old Testament Israel and his economy working through them in this world and the New Testament church. Now, for the record, God is at work in every generation. God always has a people. He always has a people. And if you say, well, what do you think about Israel? Some of the friends who are here tonight just came back from uh, touring Israel with, with us. And I want to tell you, I love Israel, and I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And while I'm at it, I pray America stays peaceable towards Jerusalem because God is not finished with Israel. So there is a prophetic element in this portion of Scripture. We're in the book of prophecy here, you see. And so prophetically, we know that this is geared towards Israel and God's great future work in and through Israel. In fact, in a minute, we're going to read about two witnesses in Zechariah's day. Interesting. Wish you had time to take it there tonight. I don't. But when you get to Revelation, there's a parallel passage to that because in the, in the end of time, guess what the Lord's going to have here on earth? He's going to have two witnesses. And just as Israel was supposed to be his light in the Old Testament and they failed, they will be his light in the, the end of time. It's just fascinating to see all of Scripture working together. Somebody said, are you an Old Testament believer or a New Testament believer? Yes, is the answer to that question. So they're not competitors, they're completers. Then as surely as there is a prophetical element, there's a historical element because when you come to the book of Zechariah, you're dealing with historical Israel and they have been away in the Babylonian captivity and the Lord has brought them back and he's renewing their worship and they're rebuilding the temple. So you got the history and you got the prophecy. Now please don't miss this. Sandwiched between the past and the future is the what class? The yeah, this is a smart class, all right? So between the past, that's the history, and the future, that's the prophecy, there is the present where you and I are living, and I would say to you that all of these scriptures have both a historical element and a prophetical element, and they have a personal and a practical element for us. See, I don't know Zechariah. Anybody here know Zechariah? I'm just curious if you ever met him. Anybody? I don't know Zechariah. Now, for the record, I'm going to meet him someday. You ever think about all the people we're going to sit with around the throne of God someday? That's powerful. And by the way, reading through Zechariah, I got a few things I'd like to ask Zechariah about. And some things I'm just not real clear on yet. I'm working at it, but I'm looking forward to having that conversation someday, not just with him, but with the Lord himself. But the truth of the matter is, I don't know Zechariah, but I do know Zechariah's God. And the God of Zechariah is my God, and God wants to be known. Let's see what he wants to show us tonight. Look at Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. I know I said I was going to read this without comment, but could I pause just for a moment? I promise not to do it on every verse. How many of you know what it's like when somebody wakes you out of sleep and you're not all with it yet? You got that lightheaded, dizzy feeling. You need a cup of coffee feeling. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So he's, he's gone to sleep and the Lord shakes him. Can you imagine an angel waking you up and saying, God's got something to say to you, buddy? I, I think you'd get awake pretty quickly. Look at verse 2, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it. 
And his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said to me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. I must tell you that as I read this portion of Scripture, there are things that are very clear to me, and there are some things that I, I don't know that I'm perfectly clear on. Does that shock you? If anybody tells you they understand everything in the Bible, I'd get as far away from them as you possibly can. Because while proposing to be a teacher, they have failed to be students. None of us ever plumb the depths of the infinite God. You really think you're going to exhaust a God that there is no searching of his understanding? Like you really think you're going to get to the bottom of the well of the wisdom of Almighty God? No, no, we're going to spend the rest of our life studying the Word of God and seeking the Lord and, and searching to go deeper with God. And then somebody says, well, when we get to heaven, we'll know everything. That's not what the Bible says. It says you will know even as you are known. Imagine how boring it would be to get there on the first day you know everything. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, I'm going to tell you what I believe theologically. I believe we're going to spend the rest of eternity discovering more and more and more about what we received on the day of our salvation. The breadth and length and depth and height. Isn't it great to be a Christian? Isn't it an amazing thing to know the God of the Bible, the God of eternity, the God of heaven and earth? That's my God. And so when you come to a chapter like this, there may be some things you're not really clear on. In fact, does it encourage you to see that three times Zechariah had to tell, ask the angel, what does this mean? Think about this. Here's the man who's writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and three times he says to the angel, help me with this, buddy, because I don't understand what you're saying to me right now. In fact, at the end of the chapter, he repeats the question twice before he gets the answer. I don't know about you, but as a student of the Word of God, that encourages me greatly that the answer does not always come immediately. It's not always on the surface. Sometimes you've got to wait before the Lord in God's presence and search the Scriptures so that the Lord will give you the understanding. But there are a few things in this passage that are clear to me. You know, God is an amazing teacher. When the Lord Jesus walked this earth, he was the master teacher. And one of the things he always did was he used parabolic language and sometimes actual object lessons. He was always speaking in pictures. He understood that most of us are visual learners and that we understand more, more clearly what we can see plainly. So he was very often using just everyday ordinary things around him to teach the extraordinary, amazing truths of God. And that's exactly what he does in Zechariah chapter 4 for this prophet. You see, there are pictures, and in the pictures, there are principles. Let me just give you a sample of what I'm talking about before I tell you what I'm going to preach on tonight. Just look at it with me for just a second. Look in verse 2 and verse 3, because here are the pictures, and the whole chapter really revolves around them. First, there's a lampstand, a candlestick of gold. Did you know that the candlestick of gold was the most beautiful pic 
piece of furniture in the temple. That when you came into the temple, the most awe-inspiring thing was the candlestick of gold. We were just in, in Jerusalem, in the old city, and they have built now there, and this is fascinating. I think it has prophetic implications, but they are constructing all the pieces of the ancient temple. Did you know that? There is no temple there. On the Temple Mount, there is no temple. There's going to be, and they are even now recreating exact replicas to the exact design of Scripture of the ancient temple pieces of furniture in the temple and one of them is on display not far from the temple mount it is the most beautiful awe-inspiring golden candlestick you've ever seen and I stood there looking at that menorah do you understand why God always used the candlestick because what do candlesticks do they shine light what 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 is our God God is light and in him is no darkness at all Christ came into the world who is he he's the light of of the world. What was Israel's role in the Old Testament? Israel's role was to be God's light in a dark world. In a nation surrounding them in darkness, they were to hold up the light of Almighty God. For the record, they failed in that. And so, when you come to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ builds a church. And what does he say to that church? He says, ye are the what? Light of the world. You are the city set on a hill. What is our job? Our job's not just to know the light. Our job is to show the light. And so you have this candle stand, this candlestick shining light. Then look at the picture just a minute. You not only have the candlestick or the lampstand here, you have the golden oil. That's the, the word used in verse 12 for it, the golden oil. Not just oil, but the golden oil. I love this. In Scripture, oil is representative of the Holy Spirit of God. I wish I had time to talk to you about all the implications of the oil tonight. But how many of you know if you're going to have a lamp, you've got to have oil, yes? Now, I know that's real old-fashioned, and we just come in and flip switches now, but in that time, if you're going to have a candlestick, somebody has to keep the wick trimmed, and somebody has to keep the oil flowing to keep the, to keep the candlestick burning, to keep the light shining. So if you're going to have a candlestick, you better have oil. Oh, I love this. The, law, the light of the Lord doesn't come from us, friends. The light of the Lord comes from the constant flow from heaven of the supply of the sweet Holy Spirit of God. So the oil of the Lord is the spirit of almighty God, and he is constantly flowing. And then, look at it again, there are two olive trees. And the question is asked at the beginning and answered at the end of the chapter, who are the two olive trees? They are two men, Joshua and Zerubbabel. Interesting in Scripture, God often sets men in pairs. So you'll, you'll have a Moses and a Joshua. You'll have a, a Paul and a Silas. You see, he sets men in pairs. You'll have a Peter and a John. You'll, you'll have a, a Nehemiah and you'll have an Ezra along the same time period. God puts men in pairs. And at this particular time, the two olive trees were these two witnesses known as Joshua the high priest that we studied yesterday and Zerubbabel. This is very important because chapter 3 and chapter 4, these two chapters go together and they deal with these two primary leaders. Joshua the high priest was the religious leader of the people of God and Zerubbabel the governor was the, the civil leader, the civic leader of the people of God. So you've got both men and both of them are important. And I love the divine order in Scripture. In Zechariah chapter 3, God concentrates on Joshua the high priest. Watch this, please, because if you're not right with God, it doesn't matter what you do with people. So it never starts this way. It always starts this way. And what's the one primary thing God wanted out of Joshua the high priest? He wanted him to be clean. That's interesting, isn't it? You've got to get clean. Then when you come to Zechariah chapter number four, he's dealing with the governor. Do you know what the governor needs? The governor needs an authority and an ability beyond himself to get the job done. And where does that come from? From the same God who makes you clean. So the God of Joshua and the God of Zerubbabel is the God that Zechariah is seeking to help us understand and know. And I love the divine order here. First it's purity and then it's power. See, we got a world where everybody wants power without purity. I want you to know, you don't get the power without the purity. You got to get the purity to get the power. So when you get out of God's way and deal with sin, then that opens, might I say, the floodgate of the golden oil to flow unhindered through the people of God. 
these two olive trees producing fruit. They couldn't produce fruit on their own and you can't produce fruit on your own and I can't produce fruit on my own. If there's any good thing in any of us, it must be the work of the Spirit of God in us. There will be no fruit in your life and no light in this world apart from the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Somebody said, well, that's all fascinating, preacher. That's really good for Israel. What about us? I'm speaking tonight on this subject. Would you write it down, perhaps over top of chapter number four in the margin of your Bible? Just write this little phrase down. How the work of God advances. How does the work of God advance? See, they were stuck. They were, they were stuck. The work had stopped. The temple hath half constructed, half completed, and here they sat looking at each other. Sounds like a lot of churches. Just looking at each other. Talking about what used to be. Thinking about what they wish was. So how do you get from where you are to where God wants you to be? May I ask, how do you move forward in your own Christian experience? I mean, some of us have been saved a little while. How many of you have been saved? I'm just curious. I hardly ever ask this question. But let me just ask, how many of you have been saved more than 50 years? I'm just curious. More than 50 years. Wait up just a second. Good. That's amazing. How many of you have been saved at least 40 years? How many of you have been saved 30 years? 20? How many been saved at least 10 years? Would you raise your hand? I'm telling you, there's a lot of people in this room who have been saved a long time. All right? Let's all take a survey and be honest now. How many of you wish you were further along in your Christian faith and growth and grace than you are right now? I'm going to raise all of my appendages. I'm just telling you, I, look, I got saved more than 40 years ago, and I look at myself sometime and wonder, how am I ever going to get to where I really need to be as a Christian? How, how do you move forward personally? How about your family? You're at a certain stage in your family, and everybody in this room is at a different stage of family life. You're at a certain season of life. How do you get to the next season? How do you, how do you move forward as a family? How do you strengthen what God has given you that is most precious to you? And then what about this church? What about this church family? For all the good God has done here and all the blessings of the Lord, is this it? Now, you listen to me, church. This could be all there ever is. This could be it. This, it could plateau right now, and this could be it. And folks can sit around and talk about how nice it's been and how good God's been, and we can shift into neutral and coast our way to glory. Or this could be the foundation of everything else God wants to do. How's that happen? How does the work of God advance? Look, the work of God in this world People say it to me right now. They say, oh, I don't know, preacher. It just seems to me like the church is in retreat. I'm just going to remind you of something. You might be in retreat. Your local assembly might be in retreat. Your family might be in retreat. But the church of the living God is never in retreat because Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission, was famous for saying God is always advancing. I came to tell you tonight that the God that I serve is never sitting still and never going backwards. He's always going forward. The question is not, is the work of God moving forward? The question is, is the work of God moving forward in you? The Lord is at this moment advancing his calls in this world and he's looking for some people who say, I want in on that. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss that train. I want to join in in what God is doing. I want to advance with God. All right, so the question is how? I'm going to give you three simple principles tonight. They all come from right here, Zechariah chapter 4, and I want you to write them down. Would you take out a pen? I want you to write them down because I want you to meditate on them long after this preacher's voice is silent. I want you to go back through this chapter. I want you to pray through it on your knees. I want you to talk about it with your family. I want you to, to muse on it in the coming days, and I want you to make this your prayer. Dear God, please, please don't let me become some apathetic, nominal, run-of-the-mill, mediocre, average, ordinary kind a Christian just sitting around holding on and crossing my fingers for the rapture let me move forward till I see Jesus Christ I'm going to tell you the last generation church is going to have a lot to give account for when we meet Jesus at the judgment seat 
And I know it's bad, and I know culture is, is in full opposition to the Christian faith. I get that. Satan and all the hounds of hell are trying to stop it. But I'm going to tell you, when we kneel at the nail-pierced feet of Jesus, we're going to be ashamed standing next to the martyrs who gave their life talking about what a bad time we've had of it. It is time that God's people get up and get on with it and move forward for the glory of God. How does that happen? Number one, would you write this down? First of all, the work of God advances first by the power of the Holy Spirit. It must always be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that any good thing that's ever been done in this world has been done by the power of the Holy Spirit of God? When Jesus came, he came in the power of the Holy Spirit. When the New Testament church preached, they were preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Old Testament saints were praying, they were praying, though they were not always indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but they were praying by the aid of the power of Almighty God. Do you understand? Nothing happens in this world without the work of the Holy Spirit of God. I'll prove it to you. Look, please, at verse Number six, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Would you read the rest of it out loud with me, church? Ready? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I want you to circle two words in your Bible. I want you to circle the word not, and I want you to circle the word but. Because these are two key words. They're, they're like hinges that the verse swings on first of all he said it's not by might nor by power not tells you where the power doesn't come from our american christianity has gotten pretty professional we're spit shine polished all dressed up for church we got more more christian media and christian radio and christian bookstores and new york Times best-selling authors and and uh, more different study bibles and and more music on the market and on and on and on and on and on and we have less of the power of god than we've ever had you tell me why that is i'll tell you why because it's never by what man can accomplish we have had enough of what man can do we need what only god can do you ever wonder why he says not by might nor by power? Why say both if they're the same thing? What's the difference between might and power? You know what might is? Might is a word typically that references the collective force of a group of people. So some people get the idea, if we get enough people together, we really rally the majority. Friend, God's people have never been in the majority. And, and I'll just remind you, the devil knows how to get a crowd. So just because you've got a crowd doesn't mean you've got the power of God. It's not by might. It's not the resources of the collective group. And then it's not by power. It's not by your individual strength. Listen to me, church. It is not you collectively or you individually that moves the work of God forward. We've had so much religious facade. I wonder if the real thing came if we would even recognize it. I really do. We have our religious pep rallies and we're like cheerleaders and get it all revved up. And by the way, immediately somebody thinks I'm talking about some crazy nonsense and some, some band, you know, doing some worldly thing. I'm telling you, in good Bible preaching churches, we got so much flesh that many times we have grieved the Holy Spirit of God. It's what man can work up instead of what God can send down. You can't hype the work of the Holy Spirit. And friend, if it comes, you can't hide it either. When the wind of heaven blows through the place, when the oil starts to flow, when the light starts to glow, you know that's not man, that's God. One test of the real work of God is this. Are they talking about men or are they talking about the Lord? Because when God goes to work, we're not enamored with men anymore. Nobody's consumed with who the preacher was. Nobody's bragging on the singers. Nobody's talking about what a great program they put together. Everybody just wants to talk about Jesus. Why? Because that's what the Holy Spirit wants to talk about. And then look at the second part. Not tells us where it doesn't come from, but tells us where it does come from, but by my Spirit. Look, it's his lampstand. It's not your lampstand. Do you remember Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, the seven churches of Asia Minor? Every one of them was a candlestick. You remember that? And, and I love this. Read, read Revelation again. I love this. You know where Jesus is? He's walking in the midst of the candlesticks. You know where Jesus is? He's right in the middle of his people. It's his candlestick. It's his light. It's his oil. It's his spirit. It's his work. It's not our work. It's not what I can do. It's not what I can work up. I must tell you that as an evangelist, 
Sometimes I show up in places and, and people expect, well, we want to hear the best sermon you've got. You don't need my sermons. And I'm sick of preaching sermons. What do you think of that? Somebody said, well, isn't that what evangelists are supposed to do? God and heaven help us. We don't need more sermons. We need a word from the Lord. You don't need what a man can bring to town. You need what God by his spirit can send down from glory. And I tell you, the work of God doesn't move forward on our resources. Do we really think? How laughable is it to think that God Almighty, who holds the world in the palm of his hand, who knows the end from the beginning, who lives in eternity and glances at time in an instant, do we really think that that God needs anything that we have? Look, God doesn't need us, but we desperately need God. And I wonder, are you a spirit-filled man? Are you a spirit-filled woman? Is this really a spirit-filled church? See, there are marks of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Read it carefully. It's not a good show. I love your buildings. You got beautiful buildings. But I want you to know the work of God doesn't move forward on pretty buildings. The New Testament church didn't even have one. Somebody said, well, I think, you know, if we can get enough money in the bank, friend, I'm just going to tell you, God doesn't move forward on our money or on our budgets. Somebody said, well, if we can just get the preacher to preach a better sermon next Sunday. And it's going to shock you, but no church moves forward on the pastor's good sermons. No church. I don't care what church it is. I don't care who the preacher is. I'm going to tell you why. God won't share his glory with anybody. It can never be the resources of man. It must always be the resources of God. It's not a new program. It's not a clever idea. It's not something we invented. Dear Lord, deliver us from us. The work of God moves forward, number one, by the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you think your pastor ought to be a spirit-filled man? I'm just curious. I do. I mean, I don't even go here, and I think he should. I wouldn't belong to a church where the pastor didn't want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But hold on to your seat. God said every member of the church is supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit which means the power and enabling of the Holy Spirit is not just for him to perform on a platform on Sunday. The power of the Holy Spirit is for every one of us. It's for your marriage. It's for your child rearing. It's for work tomorrow. It's for dealing with your neighbors next door. It's for conducting business this week. See, there is no part of your life where the Holy Spirit of God doesn't want to govern. There, there is no, no place in your life where the light isn't supposed to shine. There is no crack or crevice in the secret compartments of your heart where the oil is not supposed to invade we can only move forward by the power of the Holy Spirit. The second principle, would you write it down? The work of God advances not only by the power of the Holy Spirit, but by the power of believing prayer. And by the way, these things are not mutually exclusive. They're all connected. The power of believing prayer. Look at verse number seven. Who art thou, O great mountain? I wonder what mountain Zerubbabel was staring at. Use a little sanctified imagination just for a second. I hope it's sanctified. Put yourself in, in, in Zerubbabel sandals for a second. Do you think perhaps the mountain that was staring him in the face was a mountain of ruins from the old temple? That maybe it was the broken down walls of the city. It was the, it was the rubbish and the refuse that had been left over from the invasion and from the, the season they were gone in captivity? Do you think that was the mountain staring him in the face? Let's get real and personal for just a minute. What's the mountain staring you in the face right now? What's the thing you're looking at and you think, I can't, I can't get through this. I, I don't know how we're going to live through this. Oh, keep reading. There's hope, friends. Remember, Zechariah is a prophet of hope. Who art thou, O great mountain? He almost says it in a demeaning way. Like, you think you're big stuff? You're nothing to God. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace to it. What is this? Is this the power of Zerubbabel and Zerubbabel's word? No, this is faith in God. This is, might I say, the faith that moves mountains. Let me show you a couple of scriptures. Hold your place here. We're coming right back. Go back in your Bible a few pages to the book of Isaiah for just a minute, would you please? Look at Isaiah 40. This is the prophecy that was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ and the coming of Christ. Now look at Isaiah 40 in verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. That's John the Baptist, right? 
Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Did you ever notice verse 4? Every valley, Isaiah 40, verse 4, every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Can I just tell you, when we finally get ready and get prepared and the Lord shows up to show his glory, look at what he does. He changes everything. Look at verse 4. Every low thing he lifts up. Every high thing he brings low. Every crooked thing he straightens out. Every rough place he makes it plain. Look, only Jesus can do that, friends. For the record, real soon Jesus is coming back. He's going to straighten everything out. Every high one is going to kneel at the feet of Jesus. Every low one is going to be lifted up to rule and to reign with him. Every crooked thing, every bit of iniquity, the Lord's going to straighten it out at the judgment. Every rough place, the Lord's going to make it plain when he rules and reigns. But do you understand the principle here that our God is able to take the mountains and make them nothing? Zerubbabel, you think that mountain's too big for God? It may be too big for you, but it's not too big for the God who made the mountains. This is not about Zerubbabel. It's about Zerubbabel's God. It's not the power of your words. It's the power of God's word in you. It's it's not what you can force your way through. It is what you can faith your way through. I'll prove it to you. Go with me to the New Testament, would you please? Go all the way to to 1 Corinthians 13 for just a second. Some of you say, well, that's the love chapter. Mm -hmm. But did you ever notice 1 Corinthians 13 verse number Look at verse number two. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have, would you mark this please, all faith so that I could remove mountains. We breeze over that on our way to the love of God because love is the chief thing. It's the great thing. It's the thing that excels all other. See, faith someday ends. Did you know faith ends? Faith ends in sight. Love never ends. Love lasts forever because God is love. Somebody say, where are we going to live someday? Heaven, I'm going to live with a God who is love. That's where I'm going. Now, please don't miss this. Paul plainly says that it is the faith that moves the mountains. Do you know that Zerubbabel is one of the greatest pictures of Christ in the Old Testament? You ought to study it out. Zerubbabel, this man that was used of God, is actually one of the types or pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's fascinating to me. And I'm thinking to myself, watch this. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, you know what he did? He moved a mountain. He moved a big mountain. Would you like to know what mountain he moved? He moved the mountain of my sin. That's what he moved. They said long, long ago in history, that Napoleon was advancing his cause and he was conquering all the nations and they got to a certain place and his advisors came to him, his captains came to him and said, we know you want to go further, but we can't go any further. The Alps are here. We, we can't go over them and we can't go around them. We, we can't get through the mountain. The mountain is stopping us from advancing. And they said, little Napoleon straightened up and said, finger in the air, then there shall be no mountains. They thought he was crazy. You know what he did? He cut a mountain pass that to this day is an engineering marvel straight through the Alps. I love this. Look, let me tell you what happened. When Jesus came and Satan stood up and said, there's a mountain of their sin. You you, you can't save them because of their sin and they can't get to God because of their sin and those people can't ever go to heaven because of their mountain of sin. Christ stood up on the cross and said, then there will be no mountain. And he removed it. And I say to you, the God who made the mountains and can move the mountains will move the mountains for us as we believe him. On our way back to our text, I want you to stop in Matthew just a second. Would you stop off in Matthew? Let me show you a couple of scriptures. Look at Matthew chapter 17. Jesus and the disciples had just come off the mountain and there was a demon-possessed boy and a desperate daddy waiting for them at the foot of the mountain. And remember the disciples that were down there couldn't cast him out and they were all frustrated and everybody running around like chickens with their head cut off trying to figure out what to do and wringing their hands. And Jesus just spoke, just rebuked, verse number 18, rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. What a Christ we serve. Look at verse 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Hey, Why could not we cast him out? 
Look at verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your what? Would you lift your head and look at me just a minute? There is one thing that limits God. Somebody said, God's not limited by anything. He's limited by one thing, our unbelief. You read the Bible carefully. There was one town. It was Jesus' hometown. It was his, it was his headquarters town. There was one town where the Bible says he could there do no mighty works. Do you know why? One reason. Because of their what? Unbelief. Somebody said, that's right, preacher. Talk to those unbelievers. No, no, no. He's talking to his disciples. Did you know you can be an unbelieving believer? See, we're, we're so worried about the unbelievers out there that have never believed on Christ. What about our unbelief? How do we expect lost people to believe on Christ if we're not operating in faith? What do you believe in God for right now? What in your life is too big for God, too hard for God? Pray tell me, please, what mountain is, is taller than your God is? It may be bigger than you, but it's not bigger than your God. Look, lift up your eyes and look at the hills, then lift it a little higher and look to heaven because there's a God in heaven that's bigger than that mountain. And Jesus says to them, your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith, there it is, as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall, mark this in your Bible, say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Would you, would you do something? Would you circle the word faith in verse 20? And would you circle the prayer in verse 21 and connect the two in your Bible and in your thinking? If you want to see the mountain move, there must be not just prayer, not just the motions and mechanics of the prayer, not just I said my prayers for the day, there must be believing prayer. When was the last time you believed God for something so big you couldn't figure it out and you couldn't fix it, but you believed God could do it? When was the last time you trusted the Lord and saw God break through? I'm going to tell you how the whole thing moves forward. It must move forward on faith. You know, Pastor, I watched that little video you sent me today, the, kind of the history of the church, and I, I saw that other building and, and kind of the progress, and, and I thought to myself, it's a beautiful thing to see a church growing and moving forward, but I've been around church all my life. I've been in lots of churches. I've been in churches of all sizes, and I've observed something. You know what it is? That in the early days of a church, somebody had to believe God. Like they didn't have any money. They didn't have a building. They didn't have any resources. They didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. So somebody had to operate in faith, and so guess what? God blessed. And you know what happens sometimes to churches? They get to the place where they get it all together, they think, and suddenly they stop exercising faith. Remember, they just have to live by their faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. If this church ever ceases to operate on the faith principle, right Ichabod over the door, the glory of God will depart. And by the way, what's true of churches collectively is true of Christians individually. People get saved early on. You know how everybody gets saved? They get saved by the grace of God through what? Faith. And you know what is really dangerous? After a while, they stop living by faith and they start living the Christian life on their energy and on their effort and on their resources. And no wonder we're so frustrated. No wonder we're so sick of it. No wonder we got so many miserable church members. Look, it is always faith in God that releases the power of God in our lives. If you want to move forward, it must be by believing prayer. I'll show you one more before we go back. Come over to Mark because not many days after the account in Matthew 17, you find this in Mark chapter number 11. See if it doesn't sound a little familiar. And now it's not a demon-possessed boy. Now it's a fig tree. God's just teaching us he's greater than everything. Look at Mark 11, verse number 21. The fig tree shrivels up, and Peter said, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, I love this. Would you underline this in your Bible two or three times? Put an exclamation point in the margin next to it. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this what, church? Anybody starting to notice a pattern here? shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Would you mark again in verse 23 the word believe, and in verse 24 the word pray, and I say again, everything must advance on the power of believing prayer. 
It's not your prayer that gets it done. I hate to tell you this. It's not even your faith that gets it done. It's the object of your faith and the one to whom you are praying. It's not you prayed the right prayer or mustered up enough faith. God says you bring a little mustard seed faith, but you pray in that mustard seed faith and the God of heaven smiles on faith and says, yes, I'm going to answer that prayer. I really do. I wonder what would happen if just the Christians gathered here on this Monday night started believing God for something and really praying. By the way, I'm not preaching some slot machine religion, some name and claim it. That's not what I'm preaching. I'm saying tonight, if you want to move forward for the Lord and you know there's something you got to have from God, then if you begin to pray in faith believing, you will see God do what only God can do and you will move forward on his power. Go back to Zechariah 4, and I'll give you the third one, and we'll be done. How do we move forward? We move forward, we advance, first, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Second, by the power of believing prayer. And third, by the power of continuing grace. I love the fact that he brings us full circle back to God. It's all Godward. But look at the end of verse number 7. After he said before Zerubbabel, that mountain will become a plain, it says this, And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying. Say the next two words with me out loud. Ready, church? Grace, grace unto it. How many of you know when God repeats himself, it's not because he forgot he said it the first time? Mm -mm. Why did he say grace twice? Watch this, please. This is... God's double grace. This is God's abounding grace. Is there sin? Oh, yes, I'm a sinner, and you're sinners. But where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Hey, how did you start anyhow? Go back, in, go back in your memory bank just a minute. How did all this start for you? I'm talking about your journey with Jesus. How did it all start? I'll tell you how it all started. It all started with grace. Watch this, please. It doesn't just start with grace. It ends with grace. It start was grace. It's finish is grace. And grace, it must be at every step in between. What does it mean? It means, friends, that this is not something we can accomplish. God must do it. Look at it just a minute. Look at verse number 7. He said he's going to bring forth the headstone. Would you circle the word headstone? Then come down to verse number 9 and circle the foundation. The hands of Zerubbabel laid the foundation of the house. So you got the headstone and you got the foundation stone. You know what the foundation stone is? That's the first stone. That's the one that went in. You know what the headstone is? That's the capstone of the whole building. I love this. Do you know what the foundation stone of the temple was? It was the grace of God. Do you know what the capstone, the headstone of it all was? It was the grace of God. Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. I want to remind you that the same God that saved you many years ago is sustaining you right now. He didn't put you in this race to leave you now. He's staying with you to the finish line, and by the grace of God, he's going to help you to keep advancing if you'll keep advancing with him. It's the story of grace. In fact, let me show you something. In verse number 7, would you mark the word shoutings? I like this. You see the shoutings there? And then come down to verse number 10 and mark the word rejoice. I love this. It's not just that they're going to finish. They're going to finish with joy. May I just testify for a moment? I'm 46 years of age. At this juncture on my journey, I'm starting to think more about the finish line than the starting blocks. I'm not trying to be morbid about it, but our kids are almost grown, and I'm thinking now suddenly. I don't know exactly where youth went, but it did. And I'm not thinking like that kid preacher anymore. I'm thinking now about the end of my life. The second half... The the rest of the story. I even changed my life verse. I don't know if you're supposed to do that or not, but I did. Acts 20, 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. I've seen a lot of people not finish right. You have too. 
Would you pray for me? Would you pray God will help me finish right? I want to finish well. Grace, grace to it. But I don't want to just finish on the right side. I'd like to finish on the bright side. I've actually been praying lately. Lord, help me not become a grumpy old man. And that sounds crazy, but I'm, I'm serious. I'm praying. Dear Lord, you know what I'm talking about. When you're young and starting out, you know, full of idealism of youth and great plans, and it's all wonderful and life's great, and then you get slapped in the face with reality and sucker punched with life, wind knocked out of you a few times. After a while, you know what you have? A whole generation of cynical, critical people just talking about how bad it is. I don't want that. I'd like to finish in grace. I'd like to finish with joy. I'd like the Lord to put the capstone, the headstone on my life and to be a testimony to the glory of God. That's what I'm praying for. My grandpa Paulie died when he was 57. He was a preacher. Started preaching when he was 13. They had to stand him on a milk crate behind the pulpit to see over the pulpit when he started preaching. He was, he was a wild man preacher. I, I didn't know him. He was just a mountain preacher, no education, and very little couth, let me just tell you. He got carried away in church one night and said, Bless God. That's what preachers say when they're about to say something they probably shouldn't say. And he said, Bless God. There's two things no church needs. That's a clock on the wall and a busy bodied woman, and this church has got both of them. That wasn't a good thing to say at all. And he didn't stay in that church long either, let me tell you. I was preaching revival in a church. I didn't know he started the church a few years ago. And a um, man came out in the lobby. I'd found out he started the church after I was there. And the uh, church doing well, too, and I was grateful to God for that. And, and the man came out in the lobby, and he said, you know your grandpa? And I said, no, sir. He died right before I was born. I said, did you know him? He started crying. And he said, oh, yes, son. He said, I didn't just know him. He said, he led me to Jesus. He said, he baptized me out behind the old church building in a pond one Sunday afternoon. He said, you know those words you preachers say when you put people under the water? I said, yes. He said, he must have been practicing that day because he held me under for a long time that day. <laughs> Grandpa died when he was 57. He died, it's no, no exaggeration, with three pennies to his name. That's what he had. That was the sum total of the money the man had. Three pennies in his pocket. It claimed his effects at the hospital and dad had his little change purse had three pennies in it. that was it my dad said to all of his siblings we're not arguing over the inheritance i'm keeping every bit of it and he did all three pennies of it taped it in the family bible at home i look at it occasionally somebody said well that's sad that's all he left huh oh no that's not all he left now the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places I have a goodly heritage. He gave me what money can't buy and death can't take away. Grandma was left alone. Dad provided a little house for her to live in the rest of her life. She lived, she probably lived 30 or 35 years after Grandpa died as a widow woman, godly woman. I can see her now. Did you know when you're young, you're stupid? How many of you know that? I should have spent more time at her house. I just, you know, you're busy. And Grandma will always be there, you know. I should have gone more. But every time I went to her house, Bible opened, lived alone, communion with God. Sometimes in the chair in the front, sometimes at the desk out back, overlooking the backyard. I was talking earlier about happy Christians. She was one. She had the beauty of God on her. That's the kind of beauty that doesn't wane with age. It grows because you've been with God. She had it. We were living in Knoxville. Now they called and they said, your grandmother's in the hospital and she's probably not going to live. She would live sometime after that, but they thought she was dying. And they said to me, if you want to see grandma before she leaves this world and goes to heaven, you probably should come. And so I got in my car and and drove the four hours back to the mountains of West Virginia. I walked into the hospital where I was born 
and went up on the third floor, I think it was, and got off the elevator and down the hall and into a room at the end of the hallway where Grandma was. And she was hooked up to all kinds of machines. And <laughs> I don't know what I expected, I guess. I expected to see a miserable woman. She was just sitting up in the bed grinning from ear to ear. I went in, sat down next to her, and she just wanted to talk about the goodness of the Lord, just how good God had been to her, how wonderful life had been, how sweet heaven would be. We were sitting there talking, and a young orderly came, and he said, uh, Miss Pauly, I have to take you downstairs for some tests. And he, he didn't know me, but he said, Sir, I'm sorry you can't go. And I said, It's no problem. I said, Could we pray before you take her? And he said, Oh, of course. He was very respectful, just a kid. And he stood over at the door and bowed his head. And I started praying. Grandma was an old-timey Christian. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And when I started praying, she started praying out loud. So the whole time I'm praying, she's praying. And I could hear her just talking to the Lord, just as natural and sweet. <laughs> I said, amen. She said, amen. He came over and unhooked her from everything and, and loosened the bed so he could roll it down the aisle. And he said to me, he said, you can follow us down the hall if you like. You can go as far as the elevator. I said, sure, I'll do that. And so I'm following along behind. And Grandma, remember, we'd just been praying, talking about the goodness of God. He started wheeling out of the room, and I can't explain it any other way. If you don't understand it, it's okay. I feel sorry for you, but it's okay. Grandma just had a spell. I don't know any other way to say it. She just got happy in Jesus. How many of you understand what I mean by that? I mean, it was nothing worked up. It wasn't for show. I mean, she thinks she's dying. Everybody thinks she's dying. And she just suddenly just overcome with the goodness of God. And I can see her now, both hands in the air. And we were Baptists, so don't get nervous. And she started clapping her hands. He's wheeling her down the hallway. She's clapping her hands, rolling down the hallway, and praising God for his goodness in her life. I wish you could have seen that boy's face. Scared him to death. It really did. He thought the old girl had lost it. That's what he thought. But she hadn't lost it. She'd gotten it. And she finished her course with joy. You say, well, I'm not much preacher. I'm glad you said that because he said right here, who had despised the day of small things? And Zerubbabel still had to work. He still has the work instruments in his hand. I'm not suggesting you lay down and don't do anything. I'm suggesting you keep working. But I'm suggesting that you keep doing right in the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of believing prayer and the power of continuing grace because when you depend upon the Lord's resources, he guarantees you can finish in his power. And that is how the work of God advances.